Minister of Trade and Climate Change of New Zealand, Mr. Akim Steiner, and my friend, Executive Secretary, United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, Dr. Fang Liu, Secretary General, International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, Mr. Ivo de Boer, Director General, GGGI, my counterpart, Ambassador Panjaitan, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Let me first take this opportunity to express my appreciation to all the Indonesian officials, sponsors, staffs, and volunteers who have been working hard at the Indonesian Pavilion to facilitate the important discussion here. I have been asked to speak about green growth and economic and climate crisis. So, I would like to talk about how in the 21st century we must shift from green economy to green economy, green growth, from climate crisis to climate dividend. I stand here as the chairman of the Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI, and of course the former president of the Republic of Indonesia. But I must confess that I am not a lifelong expert on climate economics. Far from it. Most of my life I spent as military officer and then as a politician. I did not know much about climate issues when I assumed presidency of Indonesia in 2004. But before long, and especially after Indonesia hosted the COP20, I should say COP13 in Bali in 2007, I realized that the environment and climate issues were the number one challenge to our economic progress, social well-being, and our national security. Since then, the environment has been consistently placed front and center in my government strategy of pro-growth, pro-job, pro-poor, and pro-environment. I see this to make an important point. I came to realize that without strong political, I should say, without strong political will at the top, a country would have inadequate climate policies. Political will is especially important because all the necessary structural reforms to mitigate and adapt to global warming will be massive, will be comprehensive, and as I have experienced during my presidency, it will face resistance and problems on the ground. Here lies the secret of success for green growth. Green growth has to be facilitated by government policies, supported by all government departments and agencies, implemented by governors, regions, and mayors, driven by private sectors, powered by technology and innovation, embraced by the general public, propagated by religious leaders, and practiced and inculcated by families and individuals. It also has to be pursued in mutually supportive international environment. All these elements contributed to the success of Indonesia's effort to plan for billion trees. <laughs> yes, you heard it right, not four million, four billion trees. Some people thought it was an impossible undertaking, but somewhat miraculously, in just four years, with the active participation of the officials, military, companies, workers, students, and general public, 
we managed to plant 4 billion trees across Indonesia. It was a good example of the combined power of idealism and collaborations. We can move from green economy to green economy, green growth, in the same way. Green economy had harmed Indonesia for a long time. Green was at the root of the colonialism and extreme capitalism, which plundered our natural resources for centuries for the benefit of an oppressive few. After independence, greed was the motivator of widespread corruption that kept our people poor and inequality high. And unchecked greed was the reason for the severe loss of our tropical rainforests since the 1970s, which released enormous amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. Any scheme driven by greed is bound to fail. It is not only morally wrong, it is bad business. It is economically destructive. As we struggle with the climate crisis, green economy must give way to green economy, to green growth. The rational community is now embarking on the most ambitious project of economic transformation in history to decarbonize a heavily carbonized world economy to achieve a climate resilient future. In this grand project, we are all in this together because we are all affected by it and because we are all part of the climate solution. There are over 190 countries taking part in COP21. As of now, some 185 countries have submitted their mitigation goals, the INDCs. This amounts to over 95% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Yet, according to some estimate, the cumulative total of these INDCs would only reduce the rise of global temperature to around 2.7 to 3.7 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial level. This means that while the INDCs are a good beginning, we need to be more ambitious in setting our mitigation goals to keep temperature rise below the 2 degree mark. We still have a window of opportunity to reach the two degree mark, we still have one third of the one trillion tons carbon budget to spend in the next three decades. I remain optimistic because in the coming years, we will see more breakthrough technology and game-changing innovation that would make it much easier and cheaper to, de to decarbonize our economy. But the clock is ticking. Three decades is not a long time. It is a blink in the eye of history. Which is why it is critical for all of us to mainstream green growth throughout all segments of the world economy. But in a complex world of a thousand pressing issues, how do we go about mainstreaming green growth in a country's national agenda? I would over several answers to this. The first is leadership. Green growth cannot be led by the bureaucracy. For it to succeed and become impactful, it must be the highest political agenda of the country's highest office. It is leadership that will sort out the third wars between different departments and make the hard decision of where to allocate finite resources among competing stakeholders. Due to its nature, the bureaucracy will not make changes by itself. The second tool for promoting green growth is by way of policy and regulation. The regulation can be the game changer that would shape corporate governance and social behavior to low carbon development. The problem is more often than not, it does not meet this expectation. 
to produce change, regulation must be bold and imaginative. It should provide clear incentive to expand green sectors. I should say to clear incentive to expand green sector and this incentive to curb dirty sectors. I was impressed yesterday by the Korean governor of Jeju Island, who confidently outlined his plan to transform his province to become totally carbon free by 2030. The plan will involve groundbreaking innovation such as electric cars and the complete use of renewable in place of fuel fossil fuel for energy. All this will be achieved with smart policy and regulation. The third tool for promoting green growth is investment. There can be no green growth unless you make the necessary investment in green sectors, in clean energy, in green buildings, in low carbon transport, in sustainable forestry, in sustainable palm oil and others. The reality, however, is that the existing capital is not making its way to innovation, green investment and technology. And to poorer countries in need of these resources and want to develop low carbon climate resilient economies. We all know of the 100 billion fund from developed countries that will help developing countries mitigate and adapt. I call on developed countries to keep this promise. But developing countries also need to realize that there are a lot more investment potentials out there. Indeed, sustainable invest investing looks at to be the wave of the future. Sustainable companies have outperformed their peers by 9.1% over the past four years. To attract them, government must come up with clear, ambitious, and practicable green growth strategy. Without a government blueprint, it would be very difficult for investors to come in and take the risk. The fourth tool for green growth is education. I was never educated about the environment or about global warming in my younger days. Now, I will make sure that these are the first thing my three grandchildren know about as they learn the ways of the world. While green growth policy is top down, green growth cannot survive unless its participation is bottom up from the families and individuals which form the smallest unit in society. We also need to educate the private sector that a green economy offers a seas of opportunities. I said this because in parts of the developing world, including Indonesia, many businesses have not awakened to the West potentials of a transforming, decarbonized economy. But if we can only get them to leave their comfort zones, the economic landscape can change. For example, each dollar invested in renewable today buys more capacity than ever. If a company invests 270 billion dollars in renewables in 2014, they can buy 36 percent more capacity than. 279 billion dollars spent in 2011. Similarly, solar PV, I should say solar PV cost is dropping fast. Solar PV modules are about 80% cheaper than they were in 2008. The cost of utility scale solar PV has halved in four years. All this is not a temporary phenomenon. They are part of a long-term permanent phenomenon, whereby innovation in both developed and developing countries will restructure economic sectors and create countless opportunities. We have to educate our businesses, especially micro, medium, uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises of this important fact. Fit technology and innovation. There is widespread agreement that achieving dramatic reduction in carbon emission would require innovation 
and large-scale adoptions of carbon reducing technologies throughout the global energy system. We need to creatively seek the new sources of technological change that can be derived from multiple resources, namely research and development, and spillover effect. The last term refers to the transfers of knowledge or the economic benefit of innovation from one individual, firm, industry, or entity, or from one technology to another. Last but not least, six, international cooperation. There is no single economy in the world that can achieve green growth without engaging in international cooperation. Not rich United States, not youth China, not oil rich Saudi Arabia, not mid-sized Indonesia, not island state to farm. To go green and to achieve sustainable development, they all need, they all need an international strategy. Many developing countries want to do the right things, and their political will to decarbonize is strong, but they are also desperate searching for the right policies and the right models. They want to take risks, but do not want to fail. They expect results. They want to know if others have tried and faltered so they can avoid those mistakes. They want to know what opportunities are out there to help them grow green. And they want to know what policies have been tested and proven to work on the ground in similar circumstances. There is plenty of international mechanism to help countries get on with green growth. I am delighted that GGGI has also been hard at work to have filled the gap. GGGI was founded by the global community specifically for this mission some five years ago. Since establishment, GGGI has been implementing inclusive pro-poor green growth projects that advance sustainable development in least developed, developing, and emerging countries all over the world. GGGI provides its members' countries with the spot to develop necessary institutional capacity, the expertise to tap and mobilize financial resources, and a platform to engage and coordinate with international stakeholders and partners. In my home country, in my home country of Indonesia, GGGI has been on the ground since 2013, partnering with the Ministry of National Development Planning, BAPENAS, and provincial government, with support from the Norwegian government to drive green growth in the forest and land use sector in central Kalimantan and east Kalimantan, spot the design of special economic zone, and take step to green to I should say to green the energy sector. As President Joko Widodo noted on the opening day of COP21, the government of Indonesia recently presented its one map national green growth roadmap developed with strong support from GGGI, which prioritizes climate action and green growth and aims to help meet INTC target can achieve development goals. In Colombia, GGGI plans to support Colombia in its effort to develop a national green growth vision by aligning long-term policies and supporting foreign donor financing. Just last two days, Colombia, Norway, Germany, and UK and the UK signed an agreement worth 100 million US dollars to support a pay for performance Red Plus mechanism that will combat deforestation and preserve valuable forest resources. GGGI has also worked closely with the government of Ethiopia to develop bankable investment project in support of the country's climate resilient green economy strategy. GGGI's work to support countries safe from the business as usual model toward economic growth based on inclusiveness and sustainability. Therefore, to further strengthen collaboration and support the concrete action 
that must be taken following COP21 yesterday. GGGI in partnership with the multilateral development banks and the UN Regional Commission launched the Inclusive Green Growth Partnership. The partnership aims to support developing countries to identify green growth opportunities and investment that promote inclusive and shared prosperity. The partnership will support and help drive what is required most beyond COP21, policy and implementation coordination between government, regional bodies, international organizations, as well as the private sector and civil society. So, you have it. Seek tools to mainstream green growth nationwide and worldwide leadership, policy and regulation, investment, education, technology and innovation, along with international cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here in Paris because we are all committed to addressing the climate crisis that stands before the global community. What will make our effort historic, however, are the action we take moving forward to make our commitment truly lasting. I look forward to engaging with my esteemed <coughs> colleagues here today on the initiative they are contributing to support our transition to a resilient and green growth pathway. I thank you.